All right. Um, let's uh, go uh, quickly through these questions. Uh, what is the difference between the visible and the invisible church? The visible contains unbelievers. The visible does. The wheat and the tares, they grow up together. Uh, the dragnet, the kingdom of God, likened to a great dragnet, draw, uh, drags in good fish and bad fish. Um, you have uh, professing believers, uh, but some of them are not true believers, and we have no capacity to distinguish uh, t between the two uh, with an infallible judgment. And so the church is a mixed multitude. We do the best we can, but um, undoubtedly we err. Uh, the invisible church is the true believers in all places, in all ages, in all times, uh, the truly converted um, about which the ideals of the New Testament that we reviewed um, apply. Spotless, for example. The, the invisible church is spotless. The visible church is not spotless, blameless, and so forth. All right, what are the marks of the true church? Sacraments correctly administered. Yes. Word rightly preached. Word rightly preached, yes. Discipline. 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 Ecclesiastical discipline exercised. All right, uh, what are the three primary means of grace? Word, sacraments, and prayer. Word, sacraments, and prayer. Okay. Um, uh, how many sacraments are there, and what are they? Let's see, there's seven sacraments, right? There's uh, marriage, uh, extreme unction, um, confession, um, uh, ordination. No. Okay, there's two, there's two sacraments, um, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, sacraments are both signs and seals. They are an blank sign of a blank blank. Uh, yeah, if I think if I heard you right, are, are signs and seals. They are an inward. Outward. 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 Outward sign of an inner reality. Or visible sign. Well, it says and, so you got to start with the yeah. yeah. So this could be outward, and this could be spiritual. Well, not this could be physical. Yeah. <laughs> What's that last word? Uh, yeah. Physical, spiritual. Reality. Outward sign of an inward reality, a physical sign of a spiritual reality, some, some uh, combination thereof. Um, all right, shorter catechism, number 92, what is a sacrament? This should roll right off the tongue. The sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, wherein, come on, wherein by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. It was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> How about number 93? What are the sacraments of the New Testament? The sacraments of the New Testament are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Oh, I'm, my heart is warmed by, by the, the effort that's being put into learning the catechism. Oh, that just, just really does warm my heart. Okay, um, did, did, did we adequately cover question number 11? I am showing that we did. Uh, but um, for some reason, I'm doubting myself. So if we, if, if we want to just go over that quickly, definition, uh, what makes a sacrament a sacrament? It is a, a instituted by Christ, a sign and seal. It uh, both signifies uh, spiritual realities and seals or confirms those. And they are covenantal in that they either are, as a baptism is the right of admission into the covenant community, and the Lord's Supper is the covenantal meal. Efficacy, we talked about it's not ex opere operato, it's not inherent in the sacrament, but it's necessary that faith is exercised, not tied to the piety of the ministry, but the authenticity of the church. Its efficacy is to be found in the Holy Spirit working through the word. And yet there is real efficacy. This is spiritual food and spiritual drink, as the Apostle Paul likens it in 1 Corinthians 10, 3, and 4. All right, question number 12, how many sacraments are there? Two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And um, 
I assume that you've cited some scriptural um, support for uh, all of that. Um, you know, for the Lord, for baptism, Matthew 28, 19, you don't need to go further than that. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, as for um, the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, plus the accounts of the Last Supper in the Gospels. Okay, what is the relationship between the Old Testament and New Testament sacraments? Yes, so the argument of, of the confession and, and Protestants more generally is that they are the same, substantially the same, same in meaning, same in substance. So um, yes, there it is, sorry, took time. Number five, the sacraments of the Old Testament uh, in, in, uh, in regard of the spiritual things thereby signified and exhibited were for substance the same with those of the new. In that, the, 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 the right of admission to the Old Testament with circumcision, the right of admission in the New Testament is baptism. So the, the, what, what is signified is the same. The, the meaning is the same. The function is the same. Um, the sustaining meal, Passover, uh, the Lord's Supper, covenantal meal, sustaining meal, also confirming um, the, the covenant. So a couple, of, a couple of passages where this is uh, particularly strong um, and what, we'll, we'll look at the, the particularly this verse again and again, but Romans 4.11, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal. This is Abraham. Um, as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised, the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that the righteousness would be counted to them as well. Um, he received it. He received circumcision as an adult. It was an adult baptism, in other words. Um, and what did it signify? The righteousness that he had by faith. It, it represented justification by faith and, and in which God's own righteousness is imputed to him. Okay, but, but then he's commanded to turn around and apply that to his son. So but we're jumping a little bit ahead here, but we need to keep this in mind that, that if every, in my view, every, cir every argument against infant, uh, infant baptism is an argument against inf infant circumcision. Circumcision, uh, the essence of it, it was a sign and seal of justification by faith, but it's applied to eight-day-old infant sons who are not capable of exercising conscious faith. So here, here's, here's the parallel. If we're right in having the parallel, Colossians 2, 11, and 12, in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism. I mean, he's virtually calling baptism the circumcision of Christ. So the meaning, the meaning is, the function is the same. Um, they are both cleansing ordinances. When there are adult converts, you apply it to an adult, but when the adult convert gets married and has children, then the sign of the covenant is applied to the child, the circumcision and baptism. They are equivalent signs in successive covenants. So, and then I think 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 to 4, then verse 6, the apostle Paul there is talking about the Old Testament people of God, and uh, particularly at the time of the Exodus, he says of them, they all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So what he's, what he's saying here is he's drawing a parallel between the experience of the Old Testament believer and the experience of the New Testament believer. And um, he, is, um, he is arguing that they... Um, that they in, in other words, we, we don't, he's arguing here at, at this point that we do not have an advantage over them. 
Uh, they, they ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink that we drank, and the, the spiritual drink that they drank was Christ. The rock was Christ from which they drank. And so these things can serve as examples for us. We can't, you know, at this point, we can't argue that we are in some superior qu uh, position from them. Okay, we have greater clarity uh, than they do. Um, but nevertheless, the experience is substantially the same. I should, have, I should have verse 2 here as well, because he says there, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and all ate the same spiritual drink. So you see what he's doing there? He's, he's drawing together. Look, they were baptized like we're baptized. They had the spiritual food and spiritual drink like we have spiritual food and spiritual drink. And they stumbled and they fell. These are examples for us so that we won't be guilty of the same um, apostasy and idolatry that they were guilty of. Yes. In fact, verse 5 says, and with, yet with most of them, God was not with them. Right. Right, right, right. And so he's warning them. Um, so d verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. Verse 8, do not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. So he's, 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 he's drawing a direct parallel between their experience and their um, spiritual um, sustenance that supported them and the experience of the Corinthians who were dabbling with idolatry and dabbling with immorality and uh, had some false sense of security because of it. And were some sense of superiority over that they would never do what they did. And he's saying, oh, really? Well, look, they were baptized. They, they ate the spiritual food and spiritual drink and they fell. So let the one who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. <coughs> Um, so that's, um, it's in these ways that we draw the parallel between the two, that they are substanti they substantially have the same, the same meaning. Old Testament and New Testament, covenantal meal, right of admission. Cleansing ordinance, right of, right of admission, yes? At what point did the five sacraments that had improper lineage come into the life of the church? These are... Well, exactly when I can't say, but the they are all medieval medieval developments. Um, I, I I can't put place a date on them offhand, but these are things that happened during the Middle Ages. All Is there a you know, reason or? most of the Roman Catholic novelties and innovations all date from the Middle Ages. I I'm trying to remember. I, Stuff is recorded, so it lives on in posterity forever. But I don't think Augustine talked about seven sacraments. I don't think it goes back that far. I think you have to get you can get further into the Middle Ages before they're talking about seven sacraments. All right. So, all right. So, what is baptism? Of what is baptism a sign and seal, and what does that mean? So here's the, here's the here's the confession. Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ. So there you go. There's one of the qualifications. For a sacrament to be a sacrament, it has to be instituted, ordained by Christ. Um, so it was marriage ordained by Christ. No, it predates him. Um, uh, ordination. No, it predates also. Um, you have priests in the Old Testament being ordained. Extreme unction, that's a creation of the church. Um, uh, conf or oracular conf confession, confession to a priest, that's a creation of the church. So is extreme unction like, is it, is it right. final confession? Yes, yeah. last it? rites. <clears throat> so it's based on an invention as well. Right, right. right. Last rites are something that the, you know, the priest pronounces over you know, last endowment of grace. Yes. So if I don't get my last rites, what, what happens? Uh, a longer time in prayer. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I think you, 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 you have a, um, more of a deficiency of grace than you otherwise would have had, and therefore you would have a longer period of time in purgatory. And, and look, when uh, when Justice Scalia died, I don't, you know, the, the, it was really worthwhile watching the funeral. 
but the, the, there was no assurance given like we would give typically, you know, a faithful believer that, you know, they're in a better place. and all. There was none of that because they can't say that. He's in heaven. He's in the presence of God. He's, you know, he's with Christ. Huh? Because that's presumption. It is presumption. In fact, they, they would be fairly confident that because he was not, you know, a bona fide saint with, uh, uh, you, you know, extra meritorious credits uh, that uh, had been deposited into the treasury of saints, that, uh, that no, he would have time in purgatory. At best, he would be in purgatory. Yeah, absolutely. They, they would see our, our um, theology of assurance of salvation as flippant or presumptuous. Yeah, uh, well, that's anonymatized <clears throat> at Trent. Yes. Wait, so this treasury of the saints, is that outlined and explicitly taught, or is that just something that they... Oh, oh no, that's part of Catholic dogma, for sure. Yeah. Uh, if you, you want to have an exercise in um, mind expansion, read through Trent. And, uh, you know, you'll see, it's all there. What, what the classic Roman of, Catholicism. Yeah, yeah. The practice of indulgences was based on, is that right? They, could purchase mm -hmm. when a coin purchase in the coffer. From that, yeah, yeah, purchase it, from yeah. That. Tetzel comes through Germany saying, "When a coin mm -hmm. in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory, a soul from purgatory springs." So that was a special indulgence. If you donated a certain amount of money, you know, aunt, uh, anti 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 Greta, you know, can be sprung right out of purgatory, which uh, was an exceptional indulgence. And in order to do that, you draw on that treasury of merit. Treasury of merit to which contributions were made uh, by really the saints who are not all believers. Wait. All right. So not only for the solemn admission, so there was a it's a rite of admission. There's the confessional language of the party baptized uh, into the visible church. Right. Peter at Pentecost says, "What they say? What shall we do?" And he says, "What repent and." Be baptized. And then they said there were added to the church so many souls. Added to the church through baptism. That's how you become a member of the church. You get baptized into the, in, it's the, into the visible church. So baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign, sign signifying things. So it's a cleansing ordinance. It's, uh, it's got a multiplicity of meaning. It's, uh, it's, we pour the water because... It represents the outpouring of the Spirit. We pour the water because of the, uh, the poured out blood of Christ. So it's a symbol both of justification and sanctification. It's a, in other words, it's a picture of the whole gospel. It's a, the cleansing of us by the cleansing blood of Christ. You know, 1 John 1, 7 through 9. And the outpouring Spirit of Christ who sanctifies us. So it's a sign and it's a seal. Seals confirm and ratify. The covenant of grace, of his ingrafting into Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins, of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life, which sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world. The outward element to be used in this sacrament is water, whereupon the party is to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost by a minister of the gospel lawfully called un, uh, thereunto. Why a minister of the gospel? Why can't you? Well, Southern California, when I was coming along, college years, uh, it was not um, unusual for somebody to become a believer and for just another believer to baptize them in the back backyard swimming pool. Or to go down to the beach and baptize them into the Pacific Ocean. Or for somebody to come home with a jar of water from the Jordan River. Hmm. Talk about extra efficacy. The water from the Jordan River. I mean, that. Rick Warren makes a point that if you win someone to Christ, which itself is problematic, uh, you get to baptize them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I guess what was his church? He's retired. It's a bonus. So, uh, right? Just, exactly. Just to, as a bonus, you win them to Christ and you get to baptize them. Just to explain the theology behind this, uh, because I think it sometimes gets missed. It's not as though there's magic in the hands of the minister. This is a, 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 not a matter of, of principle per se, but a practical matter, a matter of wisdom. 
this is this is here for prudential reasons. Uh, what do we? Why, why do we say that? We're going to see this with the Lord's Supper as well. Only ministers can administer the Lord's Supper. Is that because there's a verse that says that? No, it is the in the wisdom of the church, because there has been so much division, so much strife. I mean, we got whole denominations that exist over the baptism, right? We have Baptists. They are a denomination that exists, and they're not congregational, uh, be, which they came out of because of the issue of baptism. So you don't, you don't want to baptize without an explanation. See, so there are no dumb sacraments, as my Old Testament uh, teacher, God rest his soul, um, uh, Alec Mateer would say there are no dumb sacraments in the Bible. They always require explanation. They are not self-interpreting. And he would use the, the example of the seraphim com, coming down on Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, what was the meaning of this flaming seraphim coming down with a hot coal in some thongs uh, to, to approaching the mouth of of, uh, of Isaiah, he, he, he'd made the point without an explanation, that event is, I'm about to be annihilated. Instead, he touches his lips and the words of forgiveness are spoken. You need the accompanying word to explain the meaning of the visible sign. So who do you want explaining that word? Just anyone? You want to explain baptism? Have anyone explain it? They're going to get it wrong. I mean, they may, they may not, but... The odds are, unless you take those in the church who are the most thoroughly theologically educated, trained, have the grasp of the scripture, the theology, and the meaning of the sacraments, that's who you want explaining the Lord's Supper and baptism. So the, the Reformation blew up over the Lord's Supper, right? You got the Lutherans, and Luther is pounding the table saying, this is my body, and demanding consubstantiation be accepted as the, 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 the meaning of the words of institution. Uh, you've got Rome on transubstantiation. So you've, you've got the Reformed people talking about true as opposed to real presence. So you've got three different groupings there. And then, and then you go further and you've got the so-called Zwinglian view where that's where a lot of uh, the Baptist brethren end up where it's just a memorial. There's no presence at all. You can talk about the real absence. Uh, so, so, so you've got, you've got all these divisions in connection with baptism and the connection with the Lord's Supper. The point here is you want a minister who has been theologically, biblically educated and able to give an accurate description of the event that's taking place. Uh, Thomas. So, I mean, wouldn't another problem with individual baptisms be that, like, fundamentally you can't just be baptized as an individual, you have to be baptized into the church? Yes, but I'm, so, yeah, that would be a, 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 a parallel issue. Number one, into what are you being baptized? I don't think you can get baptized into thin air. That a baptism properly administered is baptizing you into a church. You have to be baptized onto the rules of the church. Otherwise, we can't do it, or it shouldn't be done. So, so that's, that, that's, that's one reason why you don't have a private baptism, but you wouldn't even want just another member to administer the baptism. You want the minister to administer it because he's going to be able to give the explanation of its meaning. So it's prudential. That's my point. The, this is required for prudential reasons. Uh, so none other than a minister. You know, when I first read this years ago, that was challenged by many in the group, some extra, extra biblical uh, requirement. And um, uh, my, I, my argument back was, no, no, this is, uh, this is uh, rightly understood as, uh, for, for, for prudential reasons, needs to be in the hands of the ministers. Yes? It seems to be reinstated in chapter 30 on church government where the church officers have the keys to the kingdom. So Yes, um, yes, admit to and exclude from is in the power of the, of the officers of the, of the church. Uh, but, but there is unity, with, with, of course, you'd expect there to be, with the confession and then the, di the directory for worship in, in, in placing the administration of the sacraments, public prayer. I mean, the whole 
basically all of the elements of worship in the hands of the ministers. Well, otherwise, <clears throat> the outline of um, gifts, officers, um, that is all throughout the New Testament, roles in the church would, would be meaningless if anybody can do anything, right? You don't have to be this to do this. You can, anybody can do any, anything in the church. I, I, yes, I think that the, the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 assume that everyone doesn't do, that everyone is not in a position to provide the leadership of the church. That the leaders are to be a set, a si set apart in terms of having higher qualifications than the average person. Blake? Uh, the Ephesians 4, 11, 12 verse uh, was, uh, when it says equipping the saints for the works of ministry, um, that was one that I wrestled with on, on this issue as far as um, who are the saints and what are the works of ministry. Do the saints include the members and do the works of ministry include baptism? Um, now the equipped is there, right? They gotta be equipped. So I'm not saying, oh yeah, yes, anybody can do it, and anybody, you know, but uh, so because that, that anyway, that's that's. Where, so that's so where I think I no, I, that that harmonizes well with what we're saying because Ephesians 4:11 starts with the God has set apart these pastors and teachers and evangelists, in other words, word gifts for the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry, M ministry being their, you know, not capital M ministry as in the ministry of the ministers but general service in the church, equipping all the people for all the various works that go on in the church, of which, you know, what the ministers do is a fraction. Uh, I mean, you start, you, start going, you start going through on occasion, we, we do, and go through and realize all that is going on out there. You know, even just the ladies who take the flowers and then go visit shut-ins with them. Nobody knows this stuff is going on. Others get take food for the, after Sunday night, and they take it and take it to various shut-ins and other people. You know, quietly these things are all going on, but at the foundation of it is this equipping ministry of the church. Okay, um, the outward element to be used in the sacrament is water, uh, wherewith the party is to, is to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost by a minister of the gospel lawfully called. So wh what are the elements of a proper baptism? Um, it's, going, it's going to be water, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and um, so the Trinitarian formula uh, by a minister of the gospel. Uh, so, so a genuine baptism then is going to be water, Trinitarian formula, preferred mode, pouring. So I would argue, because baptism represents, above all, the baptism of the Spirit, right? That's how we get the name of the baptism of the Spirit. Obviously, people watched baptisms, um, and they likened the spiritual baptism to water baptism. It would have been in that order. They would have seen John the Baptist, for example. And, and John says that he will, ba I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the spirit and fire. So you watch a water baptism, and the spirit baptism is going to parallel that. And the spirit baptism is called an outpouring. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So the outpouring of the spirit would resemble the outpouring of the water. They went down into the water, stood there, into the water, took water, poured it over the head of the one being baptized. And the, likewise, the spirit then is a baptism in that, not that the, the person is immersed, but that the, it's poured out upon them. So our preferred mode is, 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 is um, pouring, but we recognize the validity of every mode. Unlike those pesky Baptists we recognize the, valid, the validity of sprinkling, pouring, and immersion. Dipping of the persons into the water is not necessary, but 
Baptism is rightly administered by pouring, sprinkling water upon the person. So it's pretty subtle language there, but that's an acknowledgement that if it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, if it's administered with water, the name of the Trinity, any mode is recognized. It's not necessary, but it's not illegitimate either. Yes? All right. Could we pop back to sign and seal quickly? Like, would you, would you briefly describe the difference in those, and is there a, like a time difference at all? that like if people say that it's a sign for a child but it's not a seal until they're they've you know, displayed faith or something to that effect well a sign signifies something so what is baptism what are the lord's supper what are they signifying so there's that which they signify what they represent what they are a sign of and then there's the seal the the seal language is derived from the you know, the way in which you put a seal on a document, it, 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 uh, it uh, ratifies, it, uh, it's, it, um, it, it auth uh, yeah, auth authenticates, um, it confirms, and so that's what baptism and the Lord's Supper are doing. That's why we, we, when we talk about the Lord's Supper as a covenantal meal, you are each time ratifying afresh confirming afresh that um, commitment and each time baptism is administered, as we'll see in a moment, we'll try to talk about improving your baptism, you, you likewise, even as an observer and as a parent administering it to an infant or as an adult being baptized, it is, it is sealing or confirming or ratifying again uh, the meaning of the baptism. That answer your question? So is it a seal? for the child as well at that moment? Um, I, I don't see why it wouldn't be. A even if it's not fully realized at that moment. It, uh, it, 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 um, it guarantees, it is a guarantee that that will, uh, that will come about. It is a promise, a sign of the promise that, that, that the covenant will be owned, that that child will come to faith. Thomas? I mean, so as evangelicals, infant baptism is like a minority position, yeah. and like, how do you talk to a Baptist? Because like, they have scripture proofs to rebut, like, oh, repent and be baptized, you can't repent if you're not consciously making a decision. And, um, you know, they kind of like, how do you convince a Baptist with infant baptism? I guess. <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question because question number 16, who are the appropriate subjects of baptism, ex biblically explain and defend. We ask that because question number four, or uh, paragraph four says not only those that do actually profess faith in and obedience unto Christ, but also infants of one or both parents are to be baptized. So, um, so. How do we argue for these things? So here is, here's my outline of how you argue for these things. Number one, the nature of the covenant. The covenant includes children. Go back to Noah. Who goes on the ark? Did his children deserve to go on the ark? There's no indication that they did. Abraham, we talk about Noah was a righteous man. Didn't say anything about his children. They go on the ark. Um, Lot and his children, likewise, rescued from Sodom. Um, the Genesis 17, 7 through 10, this promise is for you and for your children. They are included in the covenant. Circumcision then applied to the infant sons, the sign and seal of justification, the faith that Abraham had when he was justified. He believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, right? Genesis, it's not up there, but Genesis 15, is it 4 or 6 or one of those verses? He believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Then he received circumcision as a sign of the righteousness of faith. And then he's told to apply it to his children. So there's the nature of the covenant of self, itself. Then Acts 2, 39, this promises for you and for your, um, for your children. I, I don't see how you escape the, 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 the reality that that Jewish audience is going to hear the echo of Genesis 17. I don't see how you escape that. This promise is for you and for your children. In other words, there's no fundamental change in connection with the family and your children 
when you enter into the new covenant with Christ. It's not inferior to the old covenant. It's not as though the old covenant, you got to bring your children into the covenant community, but in the new covenant, we know they're outside. We exclude them. They got to bring themselves in. No, you bring them in. It's promises for you. Jew Jews would have heard that. Would they have heard the Abrahamic covenant? Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 14 says, even if only one is, uh, one of the parents is a believer, your children are holy. I mean, how do you say that about a child on baptistic assumptions? How do you say that the child is holy, set apart? He's in a different category. There are pagans, there are believers, then there are these infants. We don't know the status of their faith, but they're holy. They're set apart. They're in a different category. They are the subjects of the promise. All right, the continuity of the covenant. Are we the, uh, are we the sons of the prophets? Are we the sons of Abraham? Heirs according to the promise at the end of Galatians 3? Yeah. Yeah, he, he is our father in the faith. That's the whole argument of Galatians 3. He was justified by faith. We're justified by faith. We are the sons of the covenant. We are the sons of Abraham. The heirs of the covenant promises. We are the Israel of God at the end of Galatians 6. Uh, the function of the sacraments within the covenant, signs and seals of faith. Uh, discontinuity um, in the covenant, baptism is the circumcision of Christ. Well, circumcision has no meaning for us. It has no significance. That's a cultural, it's a, for us it's a purely cultural phenomenon. Uh, so some cultures do, some cultures don't. Um, ap apostolic practice, uh, this is not the strongest argument that we have, but households, he and all his household were baptized. Again, what is the natural reading of the passage? What does it, what, what is, you know, what are first century people gonna, going to think when they read something like that? The household is being baptized. I mean, I mean, I mean even today, so the missionaries tell the stories about the tribal chief getting baptized, and the whole, the whole tribe gets baptized. He's, the, he's, as it were, the covenantal head. And he becomes a Christian. They all become Christians. They all get baptized. Uh, so, uh, you know, he and all his household, that's, uh, that's the argument. And, and you, you know, I, 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 you probably have heard me say, when I was, so, so when I was at Trinity Bristol, um, when I, first baptism, I went on these preaching teams. It was, it was a great privilege, by the way. J.I. Packer was, I was on his preaching team, so I got his criticisms of my preaching. It, it didn't do me any good, but I got the benefit <laughs> uh, of his criticisms. But first time I went and witnessed the infant baptisms, I, I was horrified. I was brought up a Baptist. I just thought, this is so, this is just magic. This is, why are they doing this? But. You, well, you got an argument when you arrived. Uh, yeah, I thought I already, you, you I already told that story, didn't I? When I first arrived there, I picked up at the bus station. I take the train from London to Bristol, straight across, you know, west. Got, got picked up at the bus station by, uh, by a fellow student, and we're driving around. He's Anglican, and we get in. Of course, I'm just fired up, ready to study theology, and we get on a baptism subject, and I said, yeah, Packer doesn't believe in baptism. And he said, oh, yes, he does. I said, no, he does not. He said, yes, he does. Infant baptism. Infant baptism, yeah. Infant baptism. And I, I was arguing with him because I had never before encountered anyone who was a Bible believing Christian who believed in infant baptism. So I just it just was impossible for me to believe that Packer, whose book Knowing God was like this life changing book, it sort of altered the whole direction of my adult life that and, and explained Bible and Bible doctrine with such clarity and unction and power. How can you believe in infant baptism? It's just not possible. So I had this whole argument. I didn't know what in the world I was talking about. But, but um, in somewhere April, May, six, six, eight months later, I wrote a paper on the covenant. I didn't write a paper on baptism. Wrote a paper on the covenant. Saw these covenantal things. By the end of the paper, um, I believed in infant baptism. Once I saw the nature of the covenant, it wasn't the argument from baptism, it was the argument from the covenant. So that's the way that we argue with uh, the Baptists, I think. It was what convinced me as a Baptist, horrified at infant baptism when I first I witnessed it. 
Jim? Yeah, this, going back to Thomas's question, this is a great lesson in how we answer questions like this using the whole context of scripture. This one topic, this one issue goes from Genesis all the way through, whereas um, the question of a, of a, of a Baptist per, per se would just be from one verse, oh, repent and be baptized, uh, meaning, oh, you have to be able to be a conscious believer. And you know this. This is so much deeper and and broader. And it, yeah. well, yeah, I think the best Baptists don't argue that way. But I think the people that you're going to run into are going to argue very superficially. Where does it say to baptize? I think our argument is we would expect a verse telling us not to baptize because we would assume the continuity of the covenants. Continuity: we're saved by faith, saved by grace, saved by Christ. We have the law to guide us. Uh, we have continuity. And so where there's no continuity, we expect that to be spelled out. Like in John 4, where Jesus, he spells out this continuity. We don't work, we're not, we're not restricted to worship in Jerusalem. That whole Jerusalem worship is over. No longer in this mountain shall you worship the Father, or in Samaria, but everywhere in spirit and truth. That's a new era. No, nothing like that about baptism. Yes? Um, so in the case of considering uh, the example of Moses and all, all those that came through the sea with him, considering Noah and his family, and Lot and his family, and even the, the tribes, and the tribal people where the, the chief gets baptized and everyone's in with him. Um, how, I, I understand the, the prudence and the wisdom in making sure that they know that they're saved by, by faith alone, by grace alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone. But, uh, is the sort of the knowledge and the ascent and then that missing piece of belief, is that the obedience to be baptized, is that sort of, is that sufficient to say they believe, they're obedient, they see that they need to get baptized, they're going to get baptized, that, that's a, that's a act of obedience. You mean when we baptize our infants? No, 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 a believer. Uh, so, uh, an adult. Adult that, that may be baptized as a part of the, the tribe. Right, we would we, we would want to teach them, we would catechize them for sure. Um, I get I guess the closest thing to a parallel in my experience is when I we had a, a cup, a, a Iranian couple show up in church after the massacre in Paris a few years back. Uh, that drove him into church. They wanted to know all about Christianity, and he was so thought he was ready to be baptized, and I said. Mm -mm -mm. So took him very slowly, step by step. He read, came back, read, came back, gave him, you know, inquires class booklets. We talked. He watched it online. We worked through all this, and then we baptized him, he and his wife. <coughs> but it's interesting. The wife didn't understand English so well, so he was explaining to her, and I was never quite sure what she got, but I was willing to baptize her if he said so. <laughs> because, because, because by the end, we were pushing him pretty hard, and he said, you know, if he went back to Iran, that he would probably he would be executed. A and that's when he gave us the answer as to why he wanted to go ahead and be baptized. Was what does it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But so that's when you know you're dealing with the real thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, is the difference here, you know, in Ali and Ramina versus the tribe that she professes so everyone? Is the difference here what we would look at as a credible profession? Yes. Yes. So because in the case of an adult Baptist, yes. I think we, the Baptists, the Presbyterians would all agree that we need a, a credible profession of faith. Yes. But maybe a little bit different view of what yes. constitutes a credible profession. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With a, yeah. You want a credible, or, or when, even in infant baptism, you have to have a credible profession of faith from the parents. Right, because faith is tied in the efficacy of the sacraments. It's not ex opere operato. And the, 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 difficult, the, the difficulty occurs when <clears throat> someone previously who had a Baptist view um, comes to believe in infant baptism and they have children of wide range, ranging ages. Um, which ones should be baptized and which ones should be able to make a credible profession of faith before they're baptized. It's, mm. it's, a, hard, mm. it's a hard thing to sort out, but it, is. it needs to be sorted out somehow. And I think that we're not afraid to recognize there's areas of gray where we're not quite sure what to do. 
you know, a 14-year-old is joining with the parents, and the, the, three, the two-year-old and the three-year-old are getting baptized, but what about the 14-year-old? What do we do there? So it's a, you know, you have to think it through and be wise about it, but it, that grade does not bother me. Yes? Children of believers, infants of believers, are considered holy even if they aren't baptized, right? That's what that verse I think it says that they, yeah, what's it say? I, you know, I, I, he, he, does, he doesn't tie it directly into it, but that it certainly would say that they qualify for baptism. They are holy. Uh, so, so the issue here is, the issue here is you've got a believer and an unbeliever. They join together their offspring. Does the unbeliever pollute and disqualify the child, or does the... the um, does the influence uh, migrate in the other direction so that the Christian sanctifies the fruit of the womb? Um, so if the pagans uh, polluted the fruit of the womb, then you, then you wouldn't baptize them. But if the Christian sanctifies the union so that the child is regarded as a, as a covenant child, holy, set apart, sanctified, you would baptize them. So yes, prior to the baptism, they are regarded as holy. And I've heard you say that there's a real blessing applied to the child in baptism. Yes, I'm glad you asked that because question number 17, how important is baptism? Is it optional for oneself or for one's children? Is it a means of grace? Does it convey grace? Do the sacraments actually convey grace? Do they convey what they symbolize? So is... Uh, What's the whole point of the argument we just looked at from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if it doesn't convey grace? It's a, is it a means of blessing? Is grace received? Are, are, are the sacraments, uh, prayer, and uh, the, uh, the ministry of the word, are they the primary means of grace? Is grace received? So that, that, would, that would mean that, yes, it would, be, it would be parental negligence not to baptize if we are right, it's parental negligence not to baptize your child because there's a blessing to be received. It is a means of grace. Do you receive, is there grace to be received in the administration of the Lord's Supper? Is it spiritual food? To be baptized into Christ, is that, uh, is that as meaningful as being baptized into Moses? Uh, Matt? I think it's, it's helpful for us also to understand that when the Roman Catholic Church uses the term means of grace, they're saying that the sacraments are actual conduits of grace that allows us to do the works which will gain Christ's favor. It's a much stronger use of the word. Right. So we're using the same term in different ways. And we're saying that, it, as you say, it's a blessing. It's, it's a grace is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't gain me favor with God as the Roman Catholic Um, yeah, I think we looked at this when we were looking at justification, that, uh, that, um, th that their view is that the grace you receive through the sacraments, through the word, through prayer, through the seven sacraments, it, it's, uh, I liken it to going to the gas station. You, you t gas up, you tank up, and it, it enables you then to run around doing the good works that merit salvation. That's clear in Trent. It absolutely gets spelled out. If you want a quick view, go down and grab the copy of uh, case, the case for traditional Protestant. I got Trent printed in the back on justification, and it is. It, 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 you are enabled to do the good works whereby you merit salvation. And they function opera, uh, ex opere operato. The baptismal waters, they regenerate. Uh, the Lord's Supper communicates grace whether you know what's going on, you believe anything, faith isn't necessary. It's, in, it's an inherent power that they have. And all you need to do is have implicit faith. Just believe the church when it says that this is a conduit of grace. Is Jackson? So I was talking to a Roman Catholic, and they had one of their friends. They went to a baptism on Saturday, so they usually don't do baptisms during Mass on Sunday when ostensibly everyone's going to be there. Uh, and so we would say that those, like to us, that aren't being baptized, we witness baptism. It's a means of grace to those in the congregation. Um, yes, and that I'm glad you asked that because that's question number 19. 
Uh, but first we have to do question number 18, should baptism be repeated, why or why not? I mean, our argument is it should not be repeated um, because when you come to faith, it is uh, the fulfillment of the promise of the baptism. So to, to read the confession itself, although it be a great sin to contemn, uh, this is the verbal form of the word contempt, or, or neglect this ordinance, yet grace and salvation are not so inseparably annexed unto it as that no person can be regenerated or saved without it. So that's a, that's a repudiation of re baptismal regeneration, which the Lutherans basically teach, as do the Roman Catholics, as do some high church Anglicans. You are actually regenerated. Um, you are uh, definitively... Um, you, you are, um, what's the other word I want? Actually. In, infallibly, actually regenerated by the, by the baptismal waters. Um, uh, or that all that are baptized are undoubtedly regenerated. D reject that. You, you, you don't know the nature of the, uh, the, the you, don't, you cannot quantify and, and definitively say regeneration takes place at the moment of baptism. That, that t it reduces it to a form of magic. So uh, the, the person may not be regenerated for, they, they may be re regenerated at the moment. We're not saying that can't happen. We're just saying we don't know. It might happen when they're 25 years old. So the efficacy. What would, um, I, I grew up in uh, Disciples of Christ Church. They mm -hmm. would say you have to be baptized mm -hmm. to be saved, right? Yes. Are they, are they saying then that baptism regenerates? Mm -hmm. Are they saying that as well? Or no, they're, they're, no, they're not. It is just an no, they're not at all saying that. What they're saying is that in addition to faith, you must be baptized or you will be lost. So we, we don't go that far. We say it's very, very important, but that, um, but what's that language? Um, yeah, let's, let, let, let's go on to paragraph six. The efficacy of baptism is not tied uh, to that moment of time wherein it is administered. Yet notwithstanding, by the right use of the ordinance, the grace promise is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such, whether of age or infants, as that grace belongeth unto, according to the counsel of, uh, of God's own will in his appointed time. Sacrament of baptism is but once to be administered unto any person. So we don't repeat the baptisms. We don't believe that you're regenerated by baptism or we can know that you are or that you invariably are by the by the mere administration of the baptism water in the name of the trinity the person's regenerated no blessed yes grace conferred yes quantify that no um, neglect of it therefore um it didn't quite call it sinful did it a great sin <laughs> Not only sinful, it's a great sin uh, to neglect to administer the baptism. Yes, Tom? Well, I was thinking about the relationship between baptism and the concept of election. Um, what if there's somebody who's not part of the elect who's baptized? Um, what, would be, what would the effect of that be? Would, would it happen to happen? No, if they're not elect. They're not elect. It would, yeah. if anything, increase their condemnation. Just as having the gospel preached, now you cannot claim ignorance. So if you reject it, it, it would increase that. So, yeah, yeah, all true, but it's kind of pushing me in a place I don't want to go. <laughs> um, because we don't have any reason for believing a person is not elect if they're born into a Christian family and baptized. Um, but clearly, there are those you know, who, are, who ultimately reject Christ. Though my counsel to parents is you don't quit believing in your child's salvation until the day they die. Amen. Hmm? amen. I just said amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, and you keep claiming the promise. So if you have a prodigal and... Um, 
you know, I guess we've all had prodigals to one degree or another. You, you keep praying that you pray Genesis 17, 7. You pray Acts 2, 39, that he will be a God to us and to our children. You keep play, claiming that promise and um, in the faith that uh, the meaning of their baptisms will, will be fulfilled. Uh, Five-minute break. <laughs>